quick look. Any topic that I promised I'd... Yeah, Anything about, about the Church of Wales? So Church of Wales. Just for, this, for the yeah, sake of course. Of people are well, when, um, when I joined the Church, because I was living in Wales when I became a priest, and the, uh, the service was held partly in English, the ordination service was partly in English, partly in Welsh, <laughs> for the, the benefit of the Welsh speakers. And in a number of the Welsh speaking areas, there are uh, Anglican, what we still call that, you know, Church of England churches in the Church of Wales, uh, where they do use the, uh, you know, the actual Welsh language. We've lived in Cardiff for 30 years, and I think I've probably got three words of Welsh, one well, every ten years. Now, uh, what I would say, if that's basically on the, the lines that uh, you wanted me to comment on, is that if you've been brought up as a Welsh speaker, then to have the, what we might call, what the church thinks of as the eternal verities in your own language, it's, I think, very important. I, I can use a parallel in that long before I became an Anglican priest, I was uh, a Methodist local preacher in Norfolk on one of the Methodist circuits. And there was a wonderful old man, I remember him to this day, his name was Bob Cannon. And Bob uh, was a farm worker, and he had a Norfolk accent that was classic music hall Norfolk dialect. It was lovely. And I can remember him preaching a sermon one day in this superb Norfolk accent, and he was talking about the words of Christ and the Sermon on the Mount and the other things that Jesus had said and taught. But he was saying it in this wonderful Norfolk accent, which is still as natural to me, even though I speak standard English when I'm doing my media work. Um, he was doing it in that Norfolk dialect in which I had been brought up by my father. And he said, so you can think of Jesus as he walked along by the shore of the sea, like you might walk along by the shore, say, in Yarmouth. And he's saying to these hair fishermen friends of his, and the old boy was telling me this in his, or telling the congregation this, and because most of us were, or had been brought up as children in that Norfolk accent, the fact that I've remembered it after 60 years is indicative of the importance of hearing the most important philosophical and theological concepts in the language which is most natural to you, so that you don't have to do any kind of two-stage process in your head and translate, as it were, from the language that you knew and loved as a child. And I think this is very much the case for the church in Wales, that for natural-born Welsh speakers brought up in a, a Welsh, that that would be good and beneficial and worth doing. Where it's done in a city like Cardiff, where we all speak English, and there'd be very, very few native-born Welsh speakers in Cardiff itself. Mm. Uh, I mean, we have these jokes about Cardiffian, and uh, which is um, <coughs> certain <coughs> phrases that took us a long time to get used to. Uh, if somebody means in this place or in this location, they will say by ear. And it sounds like a musician saying, I play by ear. And it took us a couple <coughs> of years to realise that the bloke was saying, in this location, in this locality. Or it's just by ear, put it by ear. By ear. Oh yes, in this place. And so I think that there is a very strong case to be made for putting the most important truths um, whether you agree with them or not, um, into uh, a language which is most familiar, because that requires the minimum of interruption, in inverted commas, in as far as the, <coughs> the minds of the thinkers and the discussers are concerned. And that um, I also found that in one church where I served as an assistant priest, it was um, extremely high church. It was Anglo-Catholic. And there are a number of these extraordinarily high church um, parishes in, in the church in Wales. And we have um, 
having to be good and honest men in as far as we humanly can, the number of sailors who were from uh, Ireland or from a Catholic background who would actually turn up in our Anglican Church of um, St. German, uh, where I served for years, and would actually say, uh, uh, Father, can I come to confession after the Mass? And you say, well, I'd love to have you, my son, and you're very welcome in my church, but I think you want St. Peter's, which is the Catholic Church down there. Oh, isn't this a Catholic Church? And they, they skittle out so quickly. That they <laughs> but... Uh, it was only, uh, I said, it was only that sort of honesty that is essential when you're thinking about philosophical and theological um, terminology that, uh, you know, and thoughts, that uh, uh, it was more, it was almost more Catholic than our friends at St. Peter's were. And uh, I think in the Church of Wales there's also a very ancient tradition, if, um, if this is the kind of thing that, you know, you'd like me to comment on, in which the very early Celtic church mm. was there before the 4th century missionaries came across. And that old Celtic tradition still lingers. And there's a very beautiful tradition that there are still places where whatever it may be written formally, that you shall do this and you shall do that and you shall include this and don't include that, that there's this spirit underneath, certainly among some of our more learned brethren who are in the uh, theological college there, it's Michael's in Cardiff and some of the other theological colleges where you can detect a hankering after the old Celtic, which was a very good and pure and noble tradition and one which I would, you know, heartily um, endorse. But, um, there's uh, a great deal of good that done there. Rowan Williams is a member of the Druids Association, if I remember rightly. Yes, he is. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Archbishop yeah. Rowan Williams. Yeah, yeah, Archbishop Rowan, yeah. Now, interesting little point there. i I just pass it across to you to have a quick look at. Thanks. When I was, uh, when I was uh, doing a programme... Uh, that dragon on there is the same dragon that Rowan Williams has on his uh, robes. And it's the Welsh dragon. And the lady goldsmith, silversmith, who made that, also um, made all, she, she made all the decorations on Rowan's robes. So that dragon is exactly the same. Oh, please pass it around, Phil, and have a look at it. And uh, when we went to see her, she was... Uh, Showing us that we were interviewing her about, you know, her work for uh, Dr. Rowan Williams, and uh, she said, "Oh, she said, I made a few. She said I thought people would be interested in that particular design of the Celtic dragon," <coughs> and she said, "So I've I've made some. They're hundred pounds in gold and twenty pounds in silver." So I said, "I have the silver one, please." <laughs> and uh, it's a very lovely design. I I'm full of admiration for the lady who made it. And, uh, so that's, uh, I like to think, I sometimes look down at that ring and think, oh yes, uh, Archbishop has got one of those. Well, <laughs> oh yes, I, I actually interviewed Rowan when, uh, yeah, did you want to have a quick look?